Hello and welcome to Ireland County by County, exploring the sights and sound, travel, culture and food which Ireland has to offer. This time we're only 30 minutes south of Dublin city centre in a place that feels like a different world completely. In the next 30 minutes. I'll be taking a guided tour of a place made famous by what many consider to be the greatest book ever written. Oh yes, she says it, yes. I'll be walking along a coastal path overlooking views which many compare to the Bay of Naples. The hundreds of food opportunities this part of Ireland has to offer, we'll be seeking out something a little different. And learning about the book festival that's reaching out to the world. Welcome to Dunleary Rathdown. The coastal town of Dunleary and its environs, which extend all the way up to the Dublin mountains, can trace its roots as a town at least as far back as the 1600s. Legislation in 1816 allowed the building of a major port to serve Dublin. It was called Kingstown, in honour of a visit by Britain's King George IV in 1821, and in 1920 was given its present name, the original Irish form of Dunleary. Over time, the town became a residential location, a seaside resort and the terminus of Ireland's first railway. This area, which is more populous than most Irish counties, stretches down as far as County Wicklow. It's packed with things to do between the mountains and the sea. And after only a short car, bus or train ride from the city centre, you end up here. It's just gorgeous. thing that strikes you about this part of the country south of Dublin is the water. Dunleary is a real coastal town and for many years was a seaside retreat for the good citizens of the capital. Nowadays you can choose from so many things to do along the coastline. All sorts of water sports and great places to visit and eat. In the natural uplands between the mountains and the sea there are fantastic walks and trails. And between the two, there are museums, galleries, and one of the biggest libraries in the country. Dunleary is a maritime centre, and I've come to learn the ropes at the Irish National Sailing and Powerboat School. Front blow out a little bit. Okay. Right. Then you just click it into forward, and right, the boat will start to move forward, yeah. and I'll let the back go. And then you can just drive us away from the pontoon, and once I say you're all right, you can turn to the right and head the set. You make it sound so easy. Right. But yeah, it's fine, yeah? Yeah. Fine. I'm just a bit nervous, but like, it's grand. You know what you're doing, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> and now you can start to straighten up and straight down the middle of the two brake Straight, orders. which is my... Your black bit. Black tape, tape. okay. Grand. There you go. And now we're driving out. I've got this. And you're just going to take us out into the middle where we'll put our sail. Easy. Even this, though, just getting out of the harbour, you, you kind of have to relax while you're doing it, don't you? Yeah, well, we're out having fun, can't be stressed. You can't be stressed. No, no. And there's loads of space for everyone to play, especially in Dunleary. I was just thinking that you've got people walking the pier, you've got people paddle boarding, there's people on rib boats. The atmosphere is phenomenal. Yeah, there's loads of room so everyone can do what they want to do. I know, and I do. I love that, that um, Dunleary is known as uh, Dublin's Riviera, so it, it only makes sense that I have my own yacht. <laughs> Having your own yacht I to go play in. I don't even need you, look at me. No, I'm going to go now. I'll be picked up and I'm going to go no, home. Don't, no, don't, no, <laughs> don't. I may need a bit of help getting that sail up. Even if you're in Dunleary for a weekend, you can come yeah. and sail for two days. And I think it's an amazing experience, isn't it? Yeah. So you do the two-day course on the sailboats with an instructor. So it'll be four of you on the boat and with one instructor. And you could go do either your level one or we could do one-day tasters normally during the summer. Or could I just sit down and let you do all the hard work? Well, that's kind of a taster. It would be, <laughs> yeah. it would be a taste of sailing. So we bring you out, show you what the boat's like, get yourself comfortable on the boat and do a little bit of steering but not necessarily teach you yeah. what's going on. And you know what? There's no better place in the world to do it, is there? Like, no, no, it's beautiful. It's just stunning. Go, we can come out, bring you up towards Dolphy or bring you up towards Quebec around the bay, so. Sailing in this part of the country is an incredible experience and I'm in good hands with Lorcan. Combining a visit to Dunleary with a sailing trip is a great way to experience the area from a different perspective. 
If you're in the area of Dunleary Harbour on a Sunday, the one thing not to miss is the People's Park. Incredibly, this used to be the site of a Martello Tower just like Joyce's, but in the 1800s it was transformed into the most gorgeous Victorian park where the locals would sit and relax. Nowadays though, on a Sunday, it comes to life with my favourite farmer's market. The Dunleary Farmer's Market is open every Sunday and is hugely popular. I'm meeting Margaret, who's been trading here for seven years. It's, the, it's probably the ultimate market in Ireland, actually. Dunleary is around so many years. I've been here seven years, and I'm known as the lamb lady. I've been called worse in my life. So I sell all our lamb directly from our farm. So we've got a farm in Wicklow, and we have three products, lamb, apple juice, and sweet corn. So we have seasonal sweet corn, which in America, of course, you're all used to it in America. But for here in Ireland, to actually grow corn is a miracle. You're almost like a small family, are you? I love it. I love the people. I love the team here. Vegans and vegetarians buy the corn and the apple juice. And they love to meet the farmer, and they love to go, well, Margaret, how was your season? How was this? And I do all these little small cuts, bespoke cuts, like a half a rack, like a cannon of lamb, side loin roast. So we're trying to separate ourselves from the big giant by saying, well, how did your dinner party go? Here's a bit of rosemary. Oh, listen, here's a mint jelly. By the way, here's a recipe. So it's an experience. It's not about shopping. It's about, God, what's Margaret got to tell me this week? And what have they got to tell me? And it's that beautiful relationship. Roy is an American who's been living and working in Dunleary for nearly 30 years. I was the first hot food vendor in the Dunleary market. That doesn't sound like a Dunleary accent. Where are you originally from? I'm from New York originally. I've been living here uh, 29 years now. I uh, moved here in 91. What brought you to Ireland? My wife was an actress here in the 70s. We were going out together in New York. And uh, somehow, for some reason, we broke up and she came to Ireland. And 15 years later, I bumped into her in New York again. She had come back and we got married. So we came over to visit in Ireland, friends of hers. And we took a drive around. We wound up in Dublin. A friend of hers said, listen, I see this place is for sale. Why don't you take a look at it? Make a long story short, we turned it into a restaurant called Toshe Mahogany Gas Pipes, <laughs> which is a Gaelic expression for a nonsense, really. It means nothing, it's kind of slang. But it's recognized by a lot of kids as you're a little crazy and whatnot. So we decided, well, we're a little crazy, let's call it that. What's the biggest difference between New York and Delirium? There's no comparison, I mean. New York is New York. New York is the most unique place in the whole world. Ireland is probably the best quality of life I've experienced in my years. Uh, living in both. Irish food has changed so much, hasn't oh, it? Oh, drastically. We like to think we were a little part of it, you know, and we really felt we were. And we really established ourselves here as residents, and we became citizens. I wouldn't live anywhere else now. Roy, thank you so much. Toshe uh, Mahogany Gas Pipe. One of the great things about this part of Ireland is that it takes about 15 minutes to get anywhere. Just south of Dunleary, you can begin your literary adventure, which features one of the most famous literary works on the planet. Ulysses, published just over a century ago, is James Joyce's masterpiece and is considered one of the most important works of modernist literature. The story centres around one day, the 16th of June 1904, and the whole thing begins here. He peered down the dark winding stairs and called up coarsely. Come up, kids. Come up, you fearful Jesuit. Solemnly, he came forward and mounted the round gun rest. He faced about and blessed gravely thrice the tower, the surrounding country, and the awakening mountains. Seamus, people couldn't possibly come to this part of the world and not chat about James Joyce. He was pretty important around these parts, wasn't he? He was very important indeed. Ulysses, obviously, is very significant. Tell us a bit about Well, of course, all the action of Ulysses takes place on Bloomsday. 16th of June, 1904, with the date when James Joyce had his first date with Nora Barnacle, and he celebrated it in his novel, his greatest work. And uh, so Bloomsday every year, actually since 1954, when we, the first celebratory Bloomsday took place, there's a big celebration, and now it's a worldwide phenomenon. He certainly was very confident of his own genius. Um, Joyce deferred to only one other author in English, that was Shakespeare. Um, in Ulysses, he parodies the entire canon of English literature and goes beyond that. So he would feel that it was really something 
deserved, I think. Seamus, the Black Panther, what's he doing here? Well, the Black Panther, uh, interestingly enough, was left on the doorstep one day here. But the, Bla the Black Panther features in Ulysses, where one of the characters, Hens, has a nightmare where he's being attacked by a Black Panther. So what do they do back at Leopold's gaff when all that's to say has been said? They gaze at stars and Stephen leaves and Bloom heads up to bed, where Molly soliloquy about every fond caress, till finally she says the word, oh yes, she says it, yes. Just a stone's throw away from the Joyce Tower Museum is the world famous 40 foot, popular with local swimmers all year round. And sure while I'm here, I might as well join them for a dip. And what a better way to end the perfect day in Dunleary than a dip in the 40 foot. The locals promise it's going to be lovely. The work of James Joyce is just one of the influences on an annual event which is rapidly making its mark on the world of literature. And it all happens here in the quaint coastal village of Dawkey, appropriately where George Bernard Shaw spent his youth and where novelist Maeve Binchy lived until her death. Every year Dawkey is home to a celebration of all things literary. I'm meeting Gary at Dawkey Castle and Heritage Centre to tell me more about the festival and what it means for the area. Dawkey in particular has connections with so many writers. For example, the four Irish Nobel Prize winners for literature all have big Dawkey connections. That's Yeats and Shaw, Seamus Heaney and Samuel Beckett. Maeve Binchy is a really popular uh, writer and so many of her books have been converted into movies as well. So. It's a really great place for having a festival. So it started over 10 years ago, and it was a book festival, a literary festival. Listowel had done it 50 years ago, so why shouldn't Dorky try it? It started quite small, but it seems to have grown into something quite big now. The initial festival was really quite a small event with local writers. It's grown over the years, and now we have international writers like Salman Rushdie, who described it as the greatest little festival in the world. Tinker Taylor, soldier, spy, everybody is here, you know, and there's great conversation. People go, they listen for an hour to a great writer or a philosopher or a, a public figure, and then they go and discuss it themselves, and it's really great. Gary, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I will be back to see you in June. The Heritage Centre features an interactive museum upstairs where visitors can learn more about the history of the area. My poor dead uncle's goose. <laughs> and stuffing made of chest nothing the master doesn't even know about it. And slice the vein so that the blood may flow freely into this shaving dish here. So Rupert, tell me about yourself and what you do here. Well, my lady, it's my job to make sure that you're safe while you're here on your visit. You can see out there to the hills. That's where the enemies are coming in from. So what do your different arrows do? Different functions, my lady. So you see that one there, that is your bodkin arrow. Any ideas what that's for? Killing. Now, when you see your enemy approaching wearing chain mail armor protection, have you seen chain mail before? The chain knitted together natural holes. So your bodkin is sharpened on the four edges there to go through the, worry not, my lady. I know what I'm doing. Through the armor into the flesh. And it will be quite amusing when you see the faces of your enemy. Yeah. Just around the corner from where the festival takes place every June, which is pretty much everywhere in the village, is one of South Dublin's hidden gems. And you can take a boat there from the picturesque Collymore Harbour out to Dawkey Island. Actually, it's not that hidden at all. It's really easy to find. We're on our way to Dawkey Island. The island was inhabited hundreds of years ago and loads of proof of that can be found in our National Museum. But today, I'm heading out there to explore with Ken, the ferryman. The island was inhabited hundreds of years ago and many of the artefacts which prove this can now be seen in the National Museum. On a day like this, it really is spectacular. Dawkey Island is one of the hidden gems on Ireland's east coast. 
A lot of people walk past this and wouldn't even notice it, but this is an ancient cross etched into the stone here. And this is the evidence that there was very early Christians on the island. So am I right in thinking, so this is a circle here? Circle and the, the, the crucifix in the middle. Yeah. Actually, if you step back, you can see it really clearly. That's amazing. The, for an island that's so small, it's just full of history. Full of history. Full wow. of history. Very cool. Uh, oh, wow. It's so uh, quaint, isn't it? Yes, and as you can see, the church has been altered. Uh, back in the 11th century, churches were much smaller than this. They didn't have fireplaces or windows. This has been altered to a two-story building, uh, so the soldiers could stay here while they constructed the Martello Tower. So they put the window in to keep an eye on the workers? Oh, they put the, obviously put the window in there to keep an eye on their workers. 26 Martello Towers built in Ireland, uh, mostly on the East Coast, and they were built in 1804, and they were manned till 1845. Uh, the enemy was the, the French, the British were at war with France. This Martello Tower was actually accessed by ladder, and the reason there was no door in it is because if the French had it come and arrived on the island, the soldiers could retreat into the Martello Tower and defend themselves. This is a fort, and this was part of, of the defences with the Martello Tower. Uh, the soldiers would have lived in here, but they would also defend the island from here. Uh, come on in and I'll show you. These are the, the rings that they would have mounted the cannon guns on. Three rings, so you have three cannon guns covering all the angles of the island and this is where the soldiers would defend the island from. So they each had a fireplace? Each had a fireplace. So uh, it's like a um, cute little apartment. Cute little apartment, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> With a view, what more With, could you want? Good and ask for better. For another spectacular view, I don't have to travel far. Just up the road is Kalini Hill, and that's where I'm headed to next. There's a part with a pathway that leads all the way to the top. It has one of the best sea cliff views on the eastern side of the country. Just below me is the Vico Road. Not only is it stunningly beautiful, it's also home to the beautiful people. If you hang around long enough, chances are you're going to bump into U2 frontman Bono. He lives over there. We've also got international stars Enya, Van Morrison and Neil Jordan who have houses close by. And when he was filming The Last Duel, Matt Damon came and lived and swam here every day. I might just go and see if he's still here. If it's something more adventurous you're after, then you'll find it at nearby Tiberdon Wood and Glencullen Adventure Park. From high wire acrobatics on zip lines to trail biking ancient forest tracks, you're sure to find some activity to work up a healthy appetite. And where better to stop off than the award-winning Olivetto restaurant at Haddington House in Dunleary. I'm finding out more about the name of the restaurant from sous chef Barry O'Neill. Olivetto. It doesn't sound very Irish. Um. It's not, no. Um, it's like our ethos is kind of Italian food through an Irish lens, you know. We like to use Irish produce um, as much as we possibly can. We still get stuff from, direct from Italy, like the peaches we're using today. They're direct from the Milan market in Italy. We get them in twice a week. They're sensational. Nearly all our veg um, is sourced in a local area, so we get uh, our tomatoes, which we use using today on the land dish from uh, McNally's Farm, which uh, set up shop in the People's Park right. on our Sunday market. So we get stuff from them. So, Kira, get it into you. Let me know what you think. That looks right, I'm going to go and cook the lamb, and I'll be watching this. Okay. okay. Well, this is the best seat in the house, isn't it? I might as well just stay yeah. here and chat chef's to you. Chef's table. Pick up a few, hit the chef's table. I love it. Barry's cooking me one of his signature dishes for my main course. Braised lamb in smoked sour cream sauce and handkerchief pasta, all served in a bed of charred cavolo nero. Some chardonnay vinegar and a little bit of mint through it. I literally just marinate the nice cavolo in that. Then we'll start to plate. So basically just the nice big unctuous chunks of lamb in, into the bowl. Look, it's already falling apart. So tender. Do you reckon this is going to beat the starter, Barry? I don't know if you're going to be uh, able to. I'd hope it would be as good anyway, look. But the passion comes across in the food. If it comes across in the food, then that's my job done. Look at that, another beauty. Well, do you know what? Thank you so much. As much as I love the chef's table, I am off out to enjoy the view. Cheers. 
It's official. Irish Italian food is now my favourite. If you're in the area, do come into Haddington House and ask for Barry. He's a genius. Only in Ireland would you find a working farm in the middle of a capital city. Airfield, set on 38 acres, was home to Letitia and Naomi, the famed Overend sisters, who ran the estate until their death in their 90s. Nowadays, still operating as a farm, it's also a cookery school, a farmer's market, and a place filled with magic for people of all ages. I'm talking to head gardener Colm O'Driscoll about what it's like to work on a farm inside a city. We take care of about eight acres of gardens, so about six acres of ornamental gardens and two acres of food production. So we try and not just garden in isolation of the environment, we try and harness the benefits of that environment, whether it be hedgerows, whether it be bees, um, they're all beneficial to an overall healthier environment. So we rely on the bees for pollination, we rely on the predators that might live in a hedgerow to predate on our aphids. These are actually leek flowers, so this is a second year crop of leeks. So in the first year they produce the edible stalk, in the second year they produce these lovely flowers. So one of the things we do here is we grow out crops for seed. So we're really all about trying to preserve heritage seed varieties. And in order to do that, you need to let the crops grow their full life cycle and go to seed. And they flower just like a traditional allium, an ornamental allium flower. The seed isn't quite ripe yet, um, it'll take another few weeks. Um, but once it is, we, we'll harvest the leek seed and we'll then and make that available to the public for sale. So are these edible then? Absolutely, this is probably one of the most common edible plants that you see available in restaurants. What is this bad boy here? This then? guy is a mallow vulcan um, and it's an extremely pretty edible flower. So our bakers in particular like this for garnishing cakes. So when it comes to edible flowers, some of them have a sweet taste and some of them have a savoury. So this can be used on the sweet side while the nasturtiums here are best used in a salad issue. So a really versatile and easy to grow um, crop. Airfield also has its own cookery school. Head chef Shane Smith is going to teach me how to make an Irish favourite, soda bread. Shane, how are you? I'm good. Um, so I was going to say soda bread is a sure staple of the Irish menu. Is it difficult to make? It's one of the easiest breads to make. I suppose when I was growing up, it was the first bread that my mum actually taught me how to make because um, for like yeast breads and stuff, there's a little bit more technical skill involved and you have to wait a bit longer, but this is literally a mix and bake bread. So it's really, really simple and really easy. So this has been baking now for around 40 minutes or so. And as you can tell, it's got a beautiful golden brown color on top. You can smell that. So I can get the cheese like straight away. Yeah. We're just going to cut it down the middle. And that crunch as well off the, the crust. It's lovely to have the bit of color actually. Yeah, the green it? is lovely. And you get that with the flat parsley is really good. And sometimes the, the spring onions is um, gorgeous. Still warm, oh man. Oh, that's so nice. But it is super tasty. And again, warm, a little bit of butter. Cheese is really good in there as well. Yeah, yeah. It's And again, I think the secret ingredient is our Jersey milk. It is really special. Really special. It has to be. I'd love to see your break with as well, actually. Wait for that. <laughs> <laughs> it helps, but uh, mm. yeah, you're only as good as your ingredients that you have. Amazingly, the farm also contains a collection of classic cars. I'm talking to Gronya Kelleher about the elder over and sister's love of motor cars. Interestingly, Letitia, the eldest of the two girls, um, decided in 1927 to go and buy herself a nice car in, in London. So off she went and she came back with a Rolls Royce. So we have still the Rolls Royce on the estate, 1927. So this is her. She's beautiful, isn't she? Beautiful, yeah, absolutely. So this is a 1927 uh, Rolls Royce and um, the only one in the world that only had one owner, which was Letitia Overend. Which is just um, phenomenal in itself. And there she was tinkering away, keeping it running. And uh, does it still run? Still runs. So still we runs. take this um, probably twice or three times a year for a spin around uh, Dundrum. I really love Airfield and it's open all year round. Dunleary is a real hidden gem and has everything a visitor could ask for. History local culinary delights, craft markets, connections with some famous literary icons, and that's just the beginning. 
Thank you so much for joining us on this whirlwind tour of Dunleary Rotdown. We're looking forward to seeing you here soon, where as you can see, there's always something to do.